Welcome to Why I Quit, a show that covers real people quitting their nine to five jobs in search of something different. Listen to inspiring conversations where we dive deep into the stories of why people quit their jobs, what were the hardest parts, where are they now, and any advice for people following the same path. We are so excited to introduce Alex Polich as this week's guest on Why I Quit. Listen as Alex discusses his journey of quitting his job as a financial advisor to buy a food truck. Learn how while attending Oktoberfest in Germany, he and his best friend, Stephen Banks, came up with the idea of starting Donor Bros. Get inspired hearing how they grew from a food truck to now having two brick and mortar locations in Baltimore. Hey, Alex, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, Dave, thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to hear your story. Do you mind starting out telling me a little bit about where you're from and transitioning that into your first full-time job? I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, specifically Catonsville, so right outside of Baltimore, and went to school all around there, ended up going to Salisbury University, and graduated with a degree in finance focused on investment. And my goal was to go into wealth management and or if I could figure out how to do it, get into hedge fund. Always thought I would be an analyst. My my mom did wealth management for 41 years. I thought that's that's what I'm gonna do. I loved her lifestyle. She provided the family with a really good life. And and I just thought that's that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go be like my mom. So graduated from Salisbury, took a job as a bank teller at Wells Fargo and quickly Worked my way over into their private client group as a financial advisor or broker down in D.C. Did that thing for a while, moved a lot of my clients over to a private practice out in Columbia, Maryland. And that's when I realized I didn't want to do it for my whole life. Was there a specific moment that you had during that where, you know, like a breaking point of where you had enough or, you know, was, were there specific things that you were like frustrated about? Yeah, so I started dating a girl who is now my wife, and uh, we moved in together, and she was having a hard time finding a job. She had a communications degree. She was having a hard time finding a job that she liked, so she told me, hey, I'm going to use my savings, and I'm going to go back to school, and I'm going to do ultrasound, and I'm going to do that as a career instead. And I thought that was pretty cool that she was like, all right, I'm not going to do this working, doing something I don't like. I'm going to do something. I do. And so I said, that's, that's cool. You do that. When you're done with that, I'm going to do the same thing. So I blame her. Yeah, she, she did that. She got a job. She loved it. She still loves it. And right when she was done, I told my manager of that office that, hey, I'm, I'm going to start a food truck with a buddy of mine. And that was that. And I transitioned all my clients over to my manager and a couple other guys in the office and took a job putting wine on shelves down in D.C. and bought a food truck and started outfitting it. So tell me about, you know, kind of the process of getting to the point of being able to quit. Was it the fact that you just wanted to find something different and you were trying different things and the food truck came along or, you know, was the food truck the goal all along or what did that look like for you? I was working constantly because when you're a financial advisor, literally everybody is a potential client. So it doesn't matter what you're doing, where you go, what time of day it is, how many drinks you've had, you need to possibly be selling at that moment because anyone might be a person that has money, person that will have money, or a person that knows people with money. So I found myself working literally at all times, getting people's phone numbers. I hate, I I don't do this anymore, but it was always figuring out a sneaky way to say, so what is it that you do? And it, it was just miserable. So I like cooking for people and I had gone to Europe back in 2011 and I saw this thing called walk to walk 
And even when I was a teller at Wells Fargo and I was doing the training, I was drawing on a notepad how I was going to start walk to walk here in Baltimore and grow it. I contacted their corporate headquarters, asked them if I could franchise. I mean, that was, it was just food has always been something I kind of wanted to do. I fell in love with it back in middle school when I got bronchitis and got stuck at home watching the Food Network because that was all that was on back then. There was no streaming. So I watched Emerald and Wolfgang and fell in love with these guys. And and I was like, all right, I'm going to do food. I like cooking for people. I'm going to do food. How how easy can I get into food? What's the lowest amount of money you can do it? And food trucks were blowing up in Baltimore at that time. So I found a food truck down in D.C. for 13 grand. And I was like, I can, I can figure out how to, how to afford this. So I bought it and you don't know what you don't know. I bought a, a sous vide food truck, which means all it had was electric and a sink. It didn't have a hood. It wasn't built to do what we ended up doing, but, uh, you, you live and you learn. So anyway, I, I, I quit. I figured out I can afford that, figured out. I got a a client who actually wanted to go in on it with me. And I was like, all right, I I quit. I'm done with this transition, my client. And I had already scheduled a trip to Oktoberfest with my best buddy, Stephen Banks. And we went to Oktoberfest. We get there. I'm telling him about, dude, I just quit my job. I'm going to start this stir fry thing as a food truck. And then goal is I'm going to build out these tiny little shops. We're going to sell stir fry in Baltimore, Uh, me and this other guy. We go to Oktoberfest. We do what you do at Oktoberfest. So we drank excessively. We got some leader hoods and we had a great time. But on the literally the first day, we're walking back to the hotel and we walk by this shop and it's just got this giant stack of rotating meat in the window. And I was like, we should probably check this out. So we go in there. It's called Donut Kebab. We eat it. Go back the next day. We go back the next day. We go to Austria a couple of days after that, hit every donor kebab spot we could find, have it in all different ways. We got it on pizza. We're having it in wraps. We're having it over rice, salad, sandwiches. And we get on the plane to come back. And he looks at me and he goes, I don't think you should do stir fry. I think you should do donor kebab. If you do donor kebab, I'll do it with you. I was like, all right, well, let's figure out how to do that. So I got back. Turns out donor kebab doesn't exist here at all. Like, like, especially at that time, not at all. And there's no way to just buy the stuff for it. So I had bought this sous vide food truck to do stir fry. And I had to figure out how to do donor kebab on this tiny little food truck. That was, that was fun. Literally cut the roof off of this food truck so I could increase the height by six inches just so i'm kind of tall and so is steven so that i could stand in it fully and then i had to put a hood in it i had a scar on my head for a while where i burnt my head on the hood because of how hot the hood got i had to install a, a fan on the top of the food truck and i had it parked in my parents driveway and there was like a deck over top of the driveway so we took the fan through the house lifted it over top of the deck put it on top of the truck and then i had to cut a hole in the in the new roof to mount the the fan to it it was a it was a rinky dink thing and and didn't we had to remove the air conditioning unit in order to put the hood in so it didn't have air conditioning anymore anyway that was a blast so so we started a food truck in june of 2017 and uh really quickly began became kind of the talk of the town in Baltimore. We used to do a lot of brewery stuff. We did Oktoberfest that over by MT. It, it was a lot of fun and also a lot of really hard work because you're working like you have a restaurant, but you're only selling food for three hours a day. So Yeah, and tell me tell me a little bit about that first year. I think something we talk about on the show with almost every guest is really that expectation of reality versus reality of that first year. Tell me a little bit about like what you thought it was going to look like and then what it actually looked like. So financially, for sure, I didn't have high expectations. No, this is going to sound terrible if anybody wants to start a restaurant, but uh, 
I, we had no idea what the food was actually going to cost us. We knew our labor was going to be zero. So that was good. But we had no idea what the food was actually going to cost. We had no idea if we could actually make money. And unlike restaurant people, we priced a menu based on market penetration and customer acquisition, not based on food cost. So we were selling at nearly no profit a lot of times. We were wasting a lot of food at the end of the day, anything that was left over. And we got, we got to the point where we ended up selling out of pretty much everything every day. That was good. But in the beginning, we're throwing it out because ultimately this food truck was a marketing ploy and you can't serve anything but 100% great stuff if you want to take that next step. So we were never serving something the next day. <laughs> There's no way. We're serving absolutely pure, fresh, best possible thing to every single customer that came through. And we're doing it well with loud music playing, dancing around, big smiles on our face, just trying to be loud and fun because that was always the plan. And we still say it to this day to our employees, is we want to be Chick-fil-A with, with like a little bit of uh, attitude, right? Like uh, a little bit more fun, but you, you expect amazing service at Chick-fil-A. And that's what we always expected is Chick-fil-A with the party. So expectations were, were low. I, I told my wife, they're still Beyonce maybe at that point, you're paying for everything for a little while. And literally all of our money went to making sure Steven's rent was paid. And then him and I were eating a lot of donut kebab. <laughs> and that was, that was it. I mean, we, we say we did it for a year, but by the end of six months, we had talked to some investors and had figured out how we were going to take the next step to brick and mortar, which was a, a whole different expectation versus reality. And talk to me about, you know, kind of the goal of getting to brick and mortar. Was that always part of the plan in terms of, you know, going from food truck to brick and mortar? Did that become apparent when you saw the amount of demand from the food truck? You knew that was like the logical next step or, you know, what did that look like? So our plan from the get go is we're going to use the food truck as a proof of concept. And because it's such a low barrier to entry. So because the stuff didn't exist here in Baltimore, really the U.S. for the most part, we needed to educate people on it. So let's be in a bunch of places at once. Can't do that unless you have a bunch of stores or something that moves. So we picked a food truck. Cost us a lot more than the 13 grand I spent on the truck because, like I said, it wasn't built for what we were doing. Uh, but still, pretty low barrier to entry when you think about it. And then we could be in a bunch of places. We only paid for licensing in Baltimore City because we didn't really see the need to go outside of the city quite yet. Um, and because it was a marketing thing, we weren't concerned with building like a fleet of trucks. Not to mention it's about 600 degrees on that truck. So nobody wants to be in that thing. The goal was we're going to do this for a year or two. And then we're going to get into brick and mortar restaurants. And then we thought we'd keep a food truck or get a new food truck or something of the sort. But that hasn't happened quite yet. We'll see. As you're getting through the process in terms of, you know, figuring out the, the brick and mortar, what is your confidence level in terms of, you know, did the first six months get you to a point where you're like, there's enough demand here. You know, we're going to make this work no matter what. Did you have um, a lot of like fear at that time in terms of like what that was going to look like or where was your mindset at? So we were all in. So we were comp. I mean, we literally, we sold out every single place we stopped. So we knew the demand was there. We had a pretty big following without spending a dime on marketing. We knew that we could sell some food. And we also knew that it was me. I would make up some stuff. I would make up a recipe. I have no culinary background. I'd make it up. I'd give it to Steven. I'm like, hey, what, what do you think of this? He'd say, no, this is disgusting. And I'd say, all right, well, what's wrong with these? I don't know. Just change it. That was our total. That was our process. So, and we, we figured it out and we ended up selling out of food everywhere. So we knew we had something. We knew if we can figure out how to sell food for 10 hours a day rather than three hours a day, 
we'll we'll be pretty successful. So by the end of that six months, I mean, we we started looking at places pretty quick and we thought for sure we'd be in Fed Hill because in our mind, donor kebab was a drunk food. And we thought we're going to go to the party town in Baltimore and we're going to open a late night spot and we're going to sell donor kebab to all the drunk people after the let out. Then we're selling out at lunchtime everywhere. And so that kind of changed our mentality of, all right, maybe it's not a drunk food. Maybe it's just an anytime food. Put it on top of a salad and it's pretty fresh. So we went up to Johns Hopkins University and Stephen drove up there early because you got to get a spot early. I was still in the prep kitchen, like finishing that day's work. And Stephen's grabbing a coffee and he's sitting near the truck and he calls me and he's like, dude, I think we should maybe take a look at this place down here because it's so internationally, like international student base. I mean, it's it's crazy. And we wouldn't have to educate anybody because a lot of these people come from areas where donor kebab already exists. And I was like, you know, we do sell out there all the time. Let's see if we can get in touch with this landlord. So we, 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 you don't know what you don't know. So we just called up the number on the side of the building and said, Hey, can we talk to this person? And they're like, yeah, no, you can't. You, you guys are a no name. You have no money. You don't have a broker. You can't afford to be here. So I, I found a broker to have the broker call him instead. And we got a meeting. They turned us down a bunch of times. We had to figure out some more money. We had to kind of get rid of that broker also because the broker thought he could play hardball. And turns out when you have no money and no reputation, you can't play hardball. We ended up basically putting on a, a mini little uh, private thing, private tasting for the ownership group of the building to convince them that, hey, we can be successful in your spot. We're different. We're local. We got a cool story. Let us try. And we promised them that we do like 450000 a year in revenue because we basically just took our food truck numbers. We're like, we'll do at least double that and we'll be able to be open more days. You don't have to worry about generators breaking in a restaurant. So like, like we're going to, we'll do at least 450. And they're like, well, you'd be our worst store if you do that, but that's okay. So they gave us a shot and we opened at the, in December of 2018 over there in Johns Hopkins University on uh, St. Paul Street. We sold out of food by 5.45 PM on our first day. And then we quickly got a whole bunch of orders in. We ran the restaurant depot. We got everything we could do. And we sold out of food by 6.45 the next day. And we're supposed to be open till 10. We we called our staff. We're like, hey, guys, you don't get to come back for a couple of days. And I called up the equipment manufacturer. I'm like, dude, I need you to overnight me a whole bunch of refrigerators. I need another freezer. We got to... We got to figure this out. Called up all the suppliers. I'm like, I know we did two days a week. We got to change it to three, change our uh, produce to six, change our meat supplier to six days a week. I mean, it was, we we didn't have, we rented a thousand square feet, but we were in a, a food truck. So a thousand square feet seems huge when you come from a food truck, but a thousand square feet is not a lot of room when you got to have two bathrooms and a lobby and a prep kitchen and then a serving area, you don't have enough room to store food. So we reopened for lunch only three days later with a whole bunch of new refrigerators, new freezer, got rid of all of our shelving. We we were we were doing pretty good. And on January 15th, we opened for our full hours. And in our first calendar year, we did one million five thousand in revenue, and we had promised the bank and the landlord four hundred fifty thousand. So it was a lot more, a lot more than what we thought it was going to be. I'm curious in terms of were you enjoying the process of just figuring out whatever was thrown at you? Was it tough to deal with all the stress that came with it? Was it a combination of both, or what did that look like? We enjoyed it. It was cool being successful on the surface 
we weren't making money because during that time period, we had to get rid of our meat manufacturer, which was kind of the, the big thing. When we were a food truck, I did everything. And I knew when we opened the store, I can't make food to serve. I thought at that point we'd serve 200 people a day. But I was like, I can't make enough food to serve 200 people a day, seven days a week. I can't do that. Let's find someone who can do it and maybe someone who's actually better. So we, we found this local meat manufacturer and gave them a hefty deposit in order for them to make a proprietary product for us. So we took the food truck recipe, they marinate it, they stack it, then they ship it to us. And that was great, except for the, the product. It was their first time doing it. They couldn't keep up. When we ended up doing double what we told them we'd do, they couldn't keep up. So we were short on product. The product was not done correctly in a lot of a lot of times. It was like falling off as we're cutting it off. So then I'm wasting a bunch. And then it turns out it was overpriced on top of that, which we didn't really realize. But I mean, because of that, we, we lost a bunch of money early on. I mean, it was, I remember calling banks uh, Stephen, and it was maybe February, and we had just finished February, and we did like I think we did a hundred and one thousand in February, which was insane. I mean, we just gangbusters, line out the door at all times, and this is no online sales, no catering, nothing. Everything was just foot traffic. We didn't do any advertising. It was just people walking in and buying food. I called banks and I said, dude, we got to figure out how to sell less food until we figure out this meat thing, because every single thing that goes out the door costs us money right now. So the more we do in revenue, the more we lose. And that is a terrible problem to do when you to have when you're doing twice as much in sales as you expected to do. So we I called up this the largest manufacturer in the company in the country for the gyro. It's called Kronos. I'm sure you've seen all their stuff somewhere, right? So Kronos, huge, huge company. I called up, I got a hold of like the VP of sales for the whole country. And he happened to be in Baltimore like two weeks later. So I had a meeting with him and I'm like, hey guy, can you make meat for us? And he was like, you can buy our stuff. Yeah, anywhere. And I was like, no, 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 I need I need you to make our meat. He was like, yeah, you're out of your mind. The only like private contract we have is Arby's. <laughs> like there's no way we're doing <laughs> a one-off store in Baltimore. He goes, you, you got to find someone else. You, but if you ever want any advice in the future or whatever, you can talk to me. And I was like, all right, whatever. So I found this meat manufacturer up in Jersey and I'm like, I called him up and I go, hey, will you guys do proprietary for us? And they go, no, you know, we don't, we don't really do that. Uh, then I told him, well, I was like, dude, we're selling 400 pounds of meat a day. It's got to be, a, they're not that big. You know, it's got to be a good deal for you guys. And they heard the number and they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll figure out how to, how to make it happen for you. So getting them to start making our product took a couple months. And every single month that it took, we lost money. So we did a million in sales in 2019. And spent a million two to get it, which is rough. Right when we opened that store, I bought Stephen and myself this picture of this iceberg because everyone sees us go from the food truck to a brick and mortar and the food truck community is tight and they're like, Oh man, you guys are you guys are killing it. And I was I said to him, like, this is that top of the iceberg, that's what everyone sees. It's it's cliche as hell, but it's what everyone sees, all the stuff underneath the water, all the, you don't get to sleep at night being declined by, I don't know, 70 different banks in order to get a loan for the first store, being declined by the landlord numerous times. And then, yeah, you see the store packed out and people think you're this crazy success. But every time a customer walked through that door, all I thought was, oh my God, we're losing money on this sale. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we were profitable by the end of 2019. And at that time, we started looking for even bigger investors because 
we were looking to do expansion. That was always the plan is we were going to figure out how to grow this thing into a very successful food chain. And then uh, COVID hit. Tell me about COVID. What, uh, what was that experience like for you? COVID was tough on a lot of industries. And I think we're going to see across like re- uh, not well, retail is going to have issues going forward, but people who work in offices or people who manage offices, rent office space, like that's going to be something tough going forward. But for restaurants, it was pretty awful, especially a restaurant. We weren't doing online sales yet. We weren't doing carry out or delivery. We were still foot traffic only at the end of 2019. Because we were so busy, we couldn't add revenue. We literally didn't have the capacity to do it. So we had just signed, we signed a lease in November of 2019 for our second location. Million three lease over 10 years. And we were going to start construction in April of 2020 on this thing. And on March 16th of 2020, I told my staff, hey guys, we got to close for like one or two weeks, see what happens with this whole COVID thing. Let it blow over. We'll be back in here really soon. Clearly, uh, I was wrong, just like the rest of the world. Yep, two weeks, just to flatten the curve. Remember, that's all we had to do. Just flatten the curve. We were going to be fine. So we (laughs) we closed for two weeks, which ended up being closed from March 16th to October, uh, sorry, August 26th, five months and 10 days, because we were on a college campus. And when you're on a college campus, 40-ish, 50% of your revenue comes from college students, the staff that works there, and the just the general like maintenance crews, the coaches, like the teachers. Those are the people who are eating your food. The people who are coming to campus because their kids are on a team that's playing against the playing against Hopkins. Like our revenue comes from Johns Hopkins University. The thing that made us extremely successful was also the thing that made it impossible to reopen because the neighborhood was a ghost town. So we figured out when Hopkins announced they were going to bring people back, we're like, we're going to reopen. And then they didn't. They brought, I don't know, 10% of the students back for that semester at the end of 2020. And it was all online. And so we did take advantage of COVID and we started online ordering figured out how to do that. Tried to dig into P and L a little bit to figure out, you know, what what can change and just how can we operate the cheapest possible place without sacrificing quality of food or customer experience. And, you know, we got the PPP loan and everyone thinks, oh, a PPP loan was this, you know, saving grace for businesses, but in in reality the PPP for restaurants was terrible absolutely awful it was based you know it's based on payroll that's not what restaurants spend money on i mean we our payroll is high compared to most restaurants because we believe in paying people as close to a living wage as possible but it's still it was, our ppp loan was 80 grand we got 80 grand and we're doing a hundred thousand dollars a month in sales which means our monthly the amount that's going out on that 100,000 is like 90 every time. So 80,000 doesn't do anything when you've been closed for five months. You know, restaurants keep enough in the bank to basically cover themselves for like a week or two. That's why all these restaurants failed. And I think had we not been a little bit, I'll call it resilient, might be desperate. I don't know what it is, but I've got I don't come from money and Steven comes from way less money than me. So we couldn't afford for this thing to fail. So we were just figuring out how to not fail. And I think if we could have, if we could have failed, it would have been easier to just walk away and be like, I guess we're done. I guess this is that. And that's that. But 
we knew that we'd I mean I, I my parents wouldn't be able to not not even just retire wouldn't be able to live you know and and neither one of us we could have gotten jobs but that was it was just trying to figure it out not to mention we had 25 employees that were looking to get their jobs back and so we we got through it we reopened and 2021 was tough but by the end of 2021 we were doing more monthly revenue than we were doing at the end of 2019 and then this year over in Hopkins we're going to be we're going to have our best year by far i mean just we are we're crushing it and now operating at a profit and we finally opened that one that we signed that lease in 2019 we opened our second location at the beginning of July of this year so that was a very very long very very expensive construction process and i'm i'm curious was there some part of the experience of closing and forcing you to start looking at online sales and forcing you to look at like the operations of your business. Do you think there's a, a part of that that helped you or helped the business get more efficient or change the business or, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? So a lot of things happened with COVID. The first thing was we were closed for long enough that I had to, go to, I have a, uh, a brother-in-law who's got a trash business. And I said to him, hey man, we can't afford to pay both me and Steven. Let me mow the lawn over here just to be able to pay for my mortgage. So one thing led to another and, and I ended up taking on a, a bigger role at that business. And I'm now, co I, I'm a CFO over there and CFO over here now. So I work in two jobs, which is fun. But because of that, I had to relinquish control at Donor Rose and allow Steven to actually run the company. And I literally only did the finance. And that has made us a significantly better company because he is a better manager of people than I am. And he's a better marketer than I am. And it allowed me to focus on the things that actually, I, I'm sure you've heard this from other people, but there's a difference between working in the business and working on the business. And I was spending a lot of time working in the business and not enough time working on the business. But once I got literally removed from anything operationally, I could only work on the business. And so COVID was this huge silver lining for us. We added marketing, we've added online revenue. Steven has grown to run the company uh, tremendously, basically without my presence whatsoever. I run payroll and make sure our bills are paid. I do a little bit more than that, but yeah. <laughs> but but no, nothing in the store anymore. It's just, yeah, it made us grow a lot quicker than we, not grow like revenue wise, but grow, as managers of people, as business owners, a lot quicker than we probably ever would have without the struggles of figuring it out. And you know what? There was a time before COVID where I couldn't sleep at night and I was grinding my teeth and I was literally trying to figure, I'd talk to doctors, like, how do I figure out how to get to sleep? I'm so stressed out. And then COVID happened and you realize that that didn't put you out of business. And I've been sleeping like a baby since then, because if that doesn't put you out of business, then really nothing's that bad anymore. I mean, that was the worst possible thing that could have happened for us. And we survived. So now everything's really like, eh, it could be worse. You know, kind of going off on that vein, you know, I, I'm curious in terms of how you look at work-life balance. I know that, you know, you put everything into building and growing the food truck and then, you know, the brick and mortar. And then now you have another job on top of that. You know, how do you look at like separating work and life or how that combines um, and how you manage it together? I'm awful at that. Just 
full transparency, just terrible. I think these things, these Apple watches, having email on your phone, it's all terrible. I mean, I'm connected at all times. And I, I just had a baby boy like three months ago. So very fresh. That's why I'm over here in this guest room. So I lost my office to my son now, but uh, he deserves a room, I guess. My wife's been a, a rock star for us. She puts up with it. I try my best to to be home. If I can work from home, I do. I, I'm just terrible. I'm terrible at work-life balance. I do a lot more work than life, and and I bring it home with me, and I'm in the process of working out a deal where we're expanding the trash business, and I've got a investor coming on board hopefully soon with the restaurant thing, and you know we're looking to grow and. I'm just, I'm really, really bad at it. I am not a good example for your podcast of like quitting and, and taking the, I'm going to put more energy into, <laughs> into the things that are important. I think being a financial advisor, all of my wealthy clients were people who own businesses and their eventual lifestyle was one that I want to have. And I'm willing to, I hate the term grind, but I'm willing to put it all on the line right now and work as hard as I possibly can to set myself, my son, and ideally his kids up for financial success forever. Like I said, I grew up in a household where we were well off and my mom provided us a great life. But you, most people don't build generational wealth working for someone else. I want financial freedom for forever. I don't want to go back to the days where I'm waiting till I make a credit card payment so that I can pay for the gas so that I can get to work to even get the commission to then be able to make the next credit card payment. I don't want my kids to ever feel that way. It's hard. It's a hard thing to, to have to balance money constantly. I mean, I used to have a lot more hair and it all went it all went when I started working. You know, there are a lot of people who, you know, are either looking to quit or have recently quit. And, you know, what's one piece of advice that you were given, you know, before you did or that you wish you knew kind of, you know, beforehand that would be helpful for people going through a similar process? I don't know about advice, but perspective. I know that I was arguably more financially stable in my job, even though it was commission-based. But my happiness has quadrupled or more. My confidence has quadrupled or more. And my wife noticed that right away. I think that I, I don't have a great work-life balance, but I'm significantly happier and a pleasure to be around rather than what I was always doing which was putting on airs or doing something that made me unhappy and if i knew that then i would have quit sooner i left wells fargo to do my uh, my private practice thinking that money was the issue and it turns out that even when you make twice as much money doing the same job if you're still unhappy it's not the money and i, I don't necessarily think everyone should be quitting their jobs to be an entrepreneur because that's hard but i do think that people should probably focus on what makes them happy and figure out how to make money doing that because it's or figure out how to spend less money i guess is the other way to go about it because i am way nicer to be around than i used to be even though i've always been a nice person i i when you're always selling and you're always fake, it's not fun. And my wife sees that and she's, even though I'm gone a lot or I'm working constantly, she's still happier today than she was when we were dating and I was doing that. To wrap it up, I asked the same question uh, to everyone. You know, what are you most excited about over the next three to five years? Well, because I wasn't busy enough, we decided to build a house. So I am excited for that. Hopefully we're moving in in March. 
we'll see 23 we'll see how long that takes and um like i said i just had my son so he'll be three months tomorrow and very excited to see how that goes i mean it's it's really cool watching a little person develop and uh, who, who they're becoming i mean he already smiles at stuff you know it's not just when he has gas so it's a lot of fun ideally we have another kid at some point i think over the next three to five years i'm excited about things with my personal life and then getting donor bros to grow without Stephen and I doing every single thing. So hiring people to help us with that. No, I love it. That sounds great. And, uh, you know, for anyone listening, especially in the Baltimore area, do you just want to give a quick elevator pitch about, you know, your offering and then where your uh, stores are located? Oh, yeah, for sure. So Donor Bros, our first location over on 3204 St. Paul Street, right off of Johns Hopkins University. Tiny little store. Um, great staff, and we sell amazing food. Our newest store that we just opened is in Harbor Point, uh, there in between Harbor East and um, Fells Point. It is a huge store. We have self-serve uh, beer on tap, um, lots of seats, great for watching sports, family things, whatever. Again, great food. Uh, we're expanding the menu every day. And it's just a, it's a good time. So that's uh, 1409 Point Street, Baltimore, Maryland, right there on the water. Love it. Well, I'm, uh, I'm excited to try it. And uh, thank you so much for your time and telling your story. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, Dave. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening. It really means a lot to us. We want to hear from you as we keep growing. Please reach out on whyquit.co if you have any feedback or potential guests. A special thanks to Chris Dole for the music. Please check out his newest album, Here's to You, on Spotify. Thank you, and we will be back next week with another episode.